Ethic five, take responsibility for your professionalism. Here's some essential advice. Be a pro. A pro delivers results. Amateurs can pursue an activity simply for the love of it and not necessarily for fame, fortune, or vocation. But when the stakes are high and we want to get something done right, it's time to call in the professionals. A pro performs at the very highest level. In your key area of focus, do you behave like a professional or an amateur? Kyle Hamilton was the strongest, most consistent member of our crew in Beijing. Four years earlier, he was the second last guy to make our boat before the Athens Olympics. He just squeaked in. What changed? Expecting to raise your game only when it counts doesn't work, Kyle told me. You have to raise your game every day. Through a series of small breakthroughs and gradual epiphanies, Kyle took responsibility for the immense effort required for success. I saw someone who stopped trying to avoid failure and grew into an athlete who pursued winning with his entire being. He picked up the onus of success and placed it on his back. In short, he became a pro. When I first met Kyle, I didn't want to be like him. In fact, before he made the senior national team in 2002, the same time as me, he had never won a major rowing race. His rowing career began at the University of British Columbia, where he joined the novice team. I rowed for the University of Victoria, across the Georgia Strait, on Vancouver Island, and used UBC as a regular punching bag. UBC never beat us. Kyle didn't stand out from the crew, and I didn't notice him that much. In his post-Olympic speech, Kyle said that when he began rowing, he was merely happy to make the university team and to see people's eyes light up when he said that his novice rowing coach, Mike Rasher, had gone to the Olympics and won a gold medal in 1992. Kyle was a big guy with natural talent, but his passive disposition put him at a disadvantage. When it came time to select Canada's eight to compete internationally, he was consistently at the bottom of the rankings and one of the last people to make the boat. He almost didn't make the Olympic team in 2004. In Kyle's own words, he had successes and failures in that quadrennial, but he remained quiet Kyle in the middle of the boat. Often, Kyle felt insecure or like a fake. Is the other shoe going to drop? Am I really that successful or is it because of the other guys in the boat? Let's be clear that in 2004, Kyle was not a bad rower by any stretch. He was one of the top rowers in the nation, but he wasn't the best. His transition from self-doubt into the self-confident and influential captain of our 2008 gold medal team is inspirational. What can we learn from Kyle? How can we build our skill of confidence? How can we become a pro? After Athens, Kyle returned to the training center where he started to make gains inch by inch. But his journey was not without doubt. Not sure that he had another Olympic cycle in his blood, he applied to law school, left Olympic training, and began working a union job at the liquor store. People working there were talking about losing their previous jobs or needing a second job to feed their kids. They're in really tough circumstances, Kyle said. He thought, here I am, voluntarily not doing a job where I'm outside with my buddies, training to be the best in the world at something. Upon this realization, Kyle emailed Coach Spracklin to recommit to training. Kyle doubled down on grit and upped his maturity. He came back to his why. He wanted gold and took responsibility for the price he had to pay. He postponed his law career and committed to hard, sweaty work towards an athletic future with no guarantees. Externally, you would have not seen the transition. Becoming a pro was a private decision that didn't show external results until 2006, when Coach Spracklin approached Kyle and asked him to be the captain of the boat. Instead of shirking from the added pressure and responsibility, Kyle stepped up his personal game. He became a pace setter who led by example. I could not be a hypocrite and ask others to do something I would not do. I had to do my work first, he said. I did not witness Kyle's transformation firsthand. I spent most of 2006 working with Craig Amerconian, the head coach of the Stanford rowing team, to turn my alma mater's bottom-of-the-barrel program into a team that would go on to win silver at the U.S. Collegiate Championships. But when I returned to the training center in the summer of 2007, it was clear that Kyle had changed from a quiet, unremarkable guy in the middle of the boat 
to someone the team couldn't do without. I wanted to be stroke of the Olympic boat. I felt like I could do a better job than anyone else in the program. I had the best skills and personality for the position and had rowed at that end of the boat in seven seat for most of my career. The seven seat sits behind the stroke seat and can control the rhythm of the boat. I always viewed that seat as the sneaky stroke, but I wanted the leadership responsibilities and growth that came with being the guy in front. Because of the strength and speed I had shown during the previous Olympic cycle and my top ranking performance in ergometer fitness tests throughout the winter, I believed I had better rapport with the team members and a greater ability to instill confidence. In rowing, like life, performance matters. But in rowing, performance is very easy to measure. If you are a consistently high performer and keep a humble, hardworking persona, you will rise quickly to the top of the leadership echelon. Our coach put Kyle in the stroke seat when I rejoined the team in 2007. Kyle had shown both the consistent performance and the humble, hard work ethic needed to rise in the leadership ranks, but he was just learning the lead seat of the boat. It was my opinion that he had difficulty asserting a rhythm that the rest of the crew could easily follow. Coach Spracklin agreed that I had the skills to be in the stroke seat, but pointed out that I had missed the entire winter at the training center. Nothing, he added, could replace our daily races in pairs and singles up and down our mile and a half long lake. Kyle, on the other hand, had a successful winter. We stuck with Kyle through the summer of 2007. I sat directly behind our stroke man in my usual seven seat and, for a short while, stewed in disappointment and self-pity. To stay motivated for this dictated status quo, I told myself that I could influence the rhythm I wanted from my regular spot in the boat. Rowing, like so much of life, is not rocket science. Breakthroughs are recognized by others after years of hard work in the darkness. If you have the right talents and work on them hard enough and long enough, others will eventually recognize the success you've had all along. In high-pressure situations, it's less likely that we will rise to the demands of an event and more likely that we will fall down to the quality of our training. The world noticed the results of Kyle's professional work ethic that summer at the Munich World Championships when he stroked our Olympic qualifying boat, setting us up as the favorites for the following year. But that was only after years of racking up small successes and failures and years of growing through the process. Kyle rose to the challenge of being a leader. He was always early for practice. He was consistent. He was predictable, prepared. He was strong. He always stood up for the values, ideas, and instructions Mike Spracklin gave us off the water. He was a team captain of very few words, but when he did speak, his words were backed up with action and integrity. His consistent character traits made it easier for me to swallow my pride and back up this man with a giant back. And it was a really big back. In the end, Kyle earned the undying respect and confidence of everyone in our boat. He became the consummate pro. He became the best, and he could only do this in an environment that challenged him. Indeed, the environment of structure and discipline generated mutual respect among every man in our crew. Work like a pro athlete. Far too often, I hear a conversation that goes something like this. Man, I love skiing. If I could only ski all the time, can you imagine being an Olympic skier? And can I tell you again how much I hate my job? People routinely confuse amateurism with professionalism. I love to run as an amateur, therefore, running professionally would be fantastic. Time for a reality check. While love of sport may have originally sparked their journey, few Olympic athletes make it to the games fueled solely by a love of sport. Most athletes must push through tremendous self-doubt, self-hate, and an extremely low income to compete with the world often only a couple times a year. If the pay is poor, the play sporadic, and the preparation constant, then why on earth do these individuals work so hard? The pursuit of excellence is far more compelling than the joy of play. Every single one of the pro Olympians I know has committed to their given profession and finds fulfillment in doing their best work every day. It's not all about what they are doing. It's about how they do it. They find enjoyment in work and disciplined action. Lasting love of their profession comes from an interest in human potential. Personal fulfillment 
experienced on the path to skill development, a relentless flow of positive energy acquired when striving for measured success, the self-knowledge gained when they push beyond their perceived limits, and the confidence that wells up within them when they accept responsibility for success and failure. The bottom line. Most of an Olympic athlete's work is done outside of competition. They spend little time playing their sport or experiencing the thrill and joy we see when cameras are rolling and the athletes are at their peak. The bulk of a pro athlete's time is spent repeating monotonous tasks until peak performance is achieved. Feeling sick? The pro shows up. Tired? A pro shows up. It's a holiday? What's a holiday? Now, more than ever, athletes must conduct themselves professionally and always give 100% day in and day out. Unceasing grit and professionalism is what powers them into the opening ceremonies and onto the podium. The professional has learned that success, like happiness, comes as a byproduct of work, writes Stephen Pressfield in The War of Art. The professional concentrates on the work. The pros do the work and, because of their ethic, have more influence over their results. Professionalism is a choice and its traits can be learned. When you dedicate yourself to routinely doing your best work, you will find invaluable fulfillment. You'll be motivated to continue and take responsibility. The joy you find in personal development and skill enhancement cannot be taken away or created by anyone else. You generate it and you reap the benefits. Grit can also be learned. On the blog Psych Central, the author of Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance, Angela Lee Duckworth, explains, Grit is the tendency to sustain interest in and effort towards very long-term goals. Self-control is the voluntary regulation of behavioral, emotional, and attentional impulses in the presence of momentarily gratifying temptations or diversions. According to Duckworth, you can assess your own grit and discover where it could use some shoring up by answering the following questions about your own character. Do new ideas and projects sometimes distract you from previous ones? Do setbacks discourage you? Have you been obsessed with a certain idea or project for a short time but later lost interest? Are you a hard worker? Do you often set a goal but later choose to pursue a different one? Do you have difficulty maintaining focus on projects that take more than a few months to complete? Do you finish whatever you begin? Are you diligent? A professional chooses to exist in an environment that rewards effort and tracks performance. Successful professionals are internally motivated. They're both their own harshest critic and biggest fan. No idea is too crazy if you're willing to work and strive for the best. When I was younger, my father, a trained economist and professional investor, would give me advice based on his interpretations of the 18th century economist, Adam Smith. You can do anything you want, he told me. Just make sure you are the best. There is always a niche for the best. The best will always make a living. Mike Spracklin would often say, When you are pushing hard and feel like you can't go anymore, you still can. At the darkest point of a rowing race, you are only one-fifth dead. Take advantage of your fear of failure and push yourself harder. What does it take to be the best? It takes hard work. Professional self-talk. Life is hard. Achieving worthwhile goals is even harder. What can you say to yourself when the going gets tough? Take a deep breath and memorize the words below. The greatest gift in life is a hard task worth doing. So, build an environment that supports work. Put more effort into creating a culture that energizes work. Take a deep breath. Be an adult. Take responsibility. Find better ways to do your job. Get some sleep and recover for the next onslaught. Don't treat it like a hobby. When it comes to the world of work, the difference is night and day between someone who approaches their job as an amateur and someone who approaches their job as a professional. They have completely different mindsets and, as a result, 
completely different personalities, behaviors, and outcomes. In my experience, amateurs at work have not connected their work to their core purpose, are inconsistent and cannot be counted on, don't feel invested in their co-workers, customers, companies, or the products and services their companies produce and sell, try to keep a low profile, adhering to the belief that the nail heads sticking up above the board are the ones that get the hammer, don't try to learn more about their work or bother to hone their craft, count the hours until the end of the day, the days until the end of the week, and the years to retirement, are consistently tardy, take long lunches, and sneak out of work early when the boss is away, perform at a level that is just good enough to get by, without an ounce of effort more, seem to be always working but don't produce many results, are always saying how busy they are. On the other hand, professionals at work treat their job as a spiritual discipline, are not defined by their work but realize it's an opportunity for them to achieve their highest and best self. Realize that true passion comes from consistency and development of skills, not from a moment of magical heart swelling. Take a metaphorical roll of tape and wrap it around their heart to get the job done, just like an athlete tapes up his injured ankle before a big game. It can be counted on in the most difficult situations. Truly enjoy and respect their coworkers, customers, companies, and the products and services they sell are always challenging the status quo, pushing the limits, and taking risks. Our constant learners always looking to improve themselves and their co-workers and their companies as they hone their craft, are so absorbed by their work that they can't fathom the idea of retirement, are often among the first to arrive at work and the last to leave each day, are self-motivated and consistently perform at the highest possible levels take the responsibility at home to turn off their cell phone. They know effective recovery is an important part of hard work. Business experts Paul and Sarah Edwards have written more than a few books on running a home business and write about what they call the serious business attitude, which makes the difference between people who succeed in business and those who don't. According to the Edwards in their book, The Secrets of Self-Employment, if you aren't serious about your business or the work you do, then you won't do what is required to succeed. And if you're not serious about your business or the work you do, then no one else will be either. Shifting to the next level of professionalism requires a significant change within yourself. The good news is that we all have the power of change for the better. If you find that an amateur mindset is holding you back, consider these steps to building a serious business attitude. Be confident. When you're confident, you feel like you've got the power to overcome any obstacle in your way. And guess what? You can. Have a positive attitude. Be optimistic about yourself, your coworkers, your company, and your future. A positive attitude will lead you to the success you seek on the job and in your life. Expect the best from yourself and others. Set your standards high and refuse to settle for less than the best. Your personal reputation and results begin and end with you. Care about your customers. When you take care of your clients and customers, they will take care of you. Commit. Don't be wishy-washy when it comes to your career, your job, your profession. Commit 100% and throw everything you've got into it. Be a professional, not an amateur. Find purpose. Does your job feel meaningless? Have you ever wondered why you're doing it? I've endured the same challenge, both as a rower and as a management consultant and executive coach. My crises of purpose were fueled by early successes followed by the realization that bigger success would take exponentially more work and commitment. Anticipating the mountains of effort and uncertain outcomes, my drive evaporated. What brought back my mojo? I reframed my focus into the perfection of a practice. I learned to fall in love with practice and responsibility. I relearned to love the small gains, the inches. I adored making tweaks and seeing marginal increases in results. I relished the mystery of my mind and how it can react so differently to the same experience depending on the day. This practice-based focus eventually reignited my passion for work. 
Picture yourself as an Olympic rower. The act of rowing can seem very pointless. You put your oar blade in the water as gently and quickly as possible, making sure your stroke is long. You lock onto a mound of water at its surface, then you accelerate the blade smoothly, linearly, and powerfully. After ensuring a long finish to your stroke, you cleanly and firmly extract the tip of the oar from the water to glide up the slide, efficiently maintaining the momentum of the hull of the boat without check. Then you repeat this motion over and over and over and over and over. It reminds me of the monk who is seeking enlightenment. He shows up at the monastery and asks the master, What must I do to obtain enlightenment? The master hands him a broom. Start with sweeping, he replies. A year later, the monk comes back to the master. What must I do to obtain enlightenment? Keep sweeping. Another year passes and the monk again asks the master. What must I do to gain enlightenment? The master replies. Master sweeping. Years and years passed. The monk, master sweeping. What must I do to gain enlightenment? Keep sweeping. The monk continues to sweep. One day, the monk reaches enlightenment. He looks up. He smiles. He takes a deep breath. And he keeps sweeping. At first glance, monks might not seem to be pros. They don't get paid. Some even have to beg on the street for food. But the best monks commit to work like a pro. They find joy in the pursuit of mastery. They possess principles, determination, and an ethic of responsibility necessary to take a simple practice to the next level, despite the difficulty of the path. Many think that purpose comes from following your passion. However, most of us have difficulty uncovering what our passion actually is. Many think passion is akin to euphoria. However, its closest relative is patience. It's not about feeling good. It's about persistence. Like patience, passion comes from the same Latin root word, pati. Pati means to suffer. The most sustainable and professional passions grow out of consistent hard work and suffering. Be present. Presence is the golden key to effective practice. You only live each day once, so be present and make the most of it. Practice is not about going through the motions with our body while our mind and spirit reside elsewhere. Practice requires focused effort that engages our entire being. Focused practice ingrains habit and skill into our unconscious. When we are in the now during practice, we create an unconscious competence within our mind, body, spirit. We develop the habit of getting the work done efficiently and effectively. A great tool we can use for bringing back presence is to imagine a guide, a teacher, coach, or monk, standing over our shoulder. When you start thinking about or connecting with anything other than the task at hand, shouts, Be here now! Then we get back to the task at hand with our full being. Ben Rutledge, a former teammate who also loves coaching, has a great saying, Practice does not make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. Presence will consistently result in a perfect practice session. I grew to love racing because of the heightened incidence of now that it brings me. When a race draws near, there is nothing else in your mental space but the goal at hand. Your nerves are primed and firing. Your body is in peak physical condition. When I race, my mind does not wander. It snaps to attention. My soul takes in the beauty of the regatta site the challenge of pushing my limits and transcending into a new state of existence excites me. I feel the same rush as I speak these words. As for doubts, they're bound to creep in. The trick is to train yourself to deal with them. Are doubts productive? Surprisingly, the answer is yes. Having no nerves is bad. You need nerves to perform at your best. When they fuel negative thoughts and fear, however, nerves can also be bad. Initially, I expected the Olympics to be larger than life and my nerves to be supersized, but to my surprise, my Olympic race felt just like other competitions I had participated in, and that scared me. To cope, I had to ignore my conscious reaction and trust the wisdom and experience 
of my body. A ritual I developed throughout my competitive career helped me stay sane on the day of my Olympic race. It helps me use my nerves to my advantage in any high-pressure situation, and it has helped many executives and others I have coached. It could help you too. The day of any big race, competition, test, presentation, or pitch for funding, I continually tell myself, today is a very special day, a day like any other day, but a little more special. Today is race day. Race days, and specifically my Olympic race days, were just that, special. By labeling our competition days as special, we can take unexpected psychological reactions in stride. The unexpected reaction becomes expected on special days. Keep showing up. The psychology underlying the ritual of calling stressful days special days is revealed in the results of a study by Stanford professor Carol Dweck that instructed one group of students to see how much you can challenge yourself on a math test. The second group was asked to get the best score you can. In the end, the students who challenged themselves in the process scored much higher than the students who were only focused on outcomes. These results underscore the importance of the growth mindset you read about earlier in this book, as championed by Dweck. A growth mindset wants to learn, she writes. This mindset embraces challenges, persists in the face of setbacks, sees effort as the path to mastery, learns from criticism, and finds inspiration from the success of others. If you're not feeling motivated, but you're still committed to seeing where your current path can take you, commit to showing up consistently. Showing up will often reveal the way forward. Energy is fluid. Energy always returns. We don't need to be motivated by our core goal. We can be motivated by doing something else. Become a big brother or a big sister. Become a better cyclist. Master the plants versus zombies video game. If you keep showing up to your main goal, either you'll make progress or you'll realize that you're not engaged in a productive activity and you'll stop. Unless and until you make that conscious decision to stop, keep showing up. And when you show up, do the best you can. We all create energy in our being, and the energy that arises within you should be used to the best of your abilities in the present moment. If you're stuck in a rut, that's okay. It's way worse to be in a rut about being in a rut. Just be in a rut. Stay present and keep showing up. Do your best. Keep trying new strategies and eventually you'll come out of the negative cycle or you'll decide that you don't want to take responsibility anymore and you'll stop. Strengthen your ethic. We all know the difference between someone who is an amateur at work and someone who is a professional. The former is not truly committed to themselves, their work, their core purpose, their co-workers, their customers, and their companies, while the latter is all in. At work right now, are you an amateur, a professional, or somewhere in between? Do you get up each day eager to get to the office and see what challenges and opportunities await you, or would you rather get back in bed? In what ways are you an amateur at work, and in what ways a professional? Why? What can you do to increase your level of professionalism in your career and decrease your amateurism? Take at least one point from below. You can record it make a picture, or write it down somewhere else. Embrace the responsibility ethic and apply this lesson to your life. 1. Be a pro. 2. Keep sweeping. 3. Get paid. 4. Take complete ownership of every part of your journey, winning and losing success and failure. 5. Keep sweeping. 6. Use professional self-talk. 7. Breathe. 8. Treat your job like a spiritual discipline. 9. Have a serious business attitude. 10. Keep sweeping. 11. Discover your work, then give your life to your work. 12. Be present. 13. Keep sweeping. <laughs>